I'm tired of hearing, well, we didn't know. No, we didn't. But some people guessed better than others. And the people who got it wrong don't seem to want to acknowledge that now. Some people said closing schools for so long was pointless and would cause much worse collateral damage to the kids, and they were right. His monologues have taken a bit of a pivot to the red pill lane. Now, we've been talking quite a bit about Bill Maher. He's got this show on HBO. I think it's called Real Time. And lately, his monologues have taken a bit of a pivot to the red pill lane. And this weekend was no exception with his observations over the retrospective outlook on our policies during COVID-19. Because on the left... The people who are actually making all of the stupid, horrible, damaging decisions through the pandemic, they want you to forget about it. They want you to say, oh, yeah, maybe mistakes were made. Well, it was the fog of war. Nobody really knew what was going on. Can we just move on now? Of course, we're going to stay in power when we move on. But keep us in power so that we can make more decisions to ruin your life. But let's just move on. Let's pay no attention to what happened during the pandemic. And some of us would like to actually learn some lessons and maybe inflict a little pain, even if that means some of these elected officials who made all these horrible decisions lose their freaking jobs or even better, get a real job out in the real world where there are repercussions if you royally screw up. Almost said a bad word. And so Bill Maher sort of highlighted that and it's worth watching. Let's watch it together, shall we? I get it that we didn't know exactly what was happening at the beginning of COVID and some mistakes were inevitable. I'm tired of hearing, well, we didn't know. No, we didn't. But some people guessed better than others. And the people who got it wrong don't seem to want to acknowledge that now. Closing schools for so long was pointless and would cause much worse collateral damage to kids. And they were right. The Daily Beast ran a story with the headline, Bill Maher pushes Steve Bannon Wuhan lab conspiracy theory. Of course, it wasn't a conspiracy theory. And now every Everyone, including the Biden administration, admits there's at least a 50-50 chance that the virus could have begun in the lab in Wuhan that was doing gain-of-function research on that virus. Duh. Ubers look like those Orthodox Jews who wrap themselves in <laughs> saran wrap in case their plane flies over a grave. We washed the mail. We played baseball in front of cardboard cutouts and ate in parking lots. They closed the ocean. We banged pots and pans to show our love for nurses and our hatred for people trying to get a baby to sleep. For two years, we had to get nostril f***ed every time we left the house. Serious people talked about having sex through glory holes. We were told to wash our hands every five minutes and don't ever touch your face. And if you absolutely must go to the beach for the sake of all that's holy, wear a mask outside. Because the last thing you would want to do when a disease is afoot is get fresh air and sunshine and vitamin D. No, much better to stay locked up, stressed out, and day drinking. And if you do get COVID, remember, natural immunity is always the worst kind. Even if you've had the disease, you need a shot. He's going to continue in a moment, but it's a good time to pause and sort of reflect. That's a pretty good look back. And and by the way, he didn't even, I mean, listen, he's going for laughs here to make a point, and we appreciate that. It's important to get laughs while you're making your point. It keeps people engaged. We try to take that lesson as well. But some of the things he didn't remind everybody of, of what decisions were made to ruin our lives during that time that maybe aren't so funny, is that our children were forced to do school from a laptop at their kitchen table. And I'm talking about kindergartners, first graders, or second graders. Uh, They fell behind over two years because of this pandemic. People died alone. There were people who were dying in hospital rooms, who were only allowed, if they were allowed a guest at all to visit them, they were allowed only one at a time. Usually it was that person's spouse who was also maybe old and traumatized. And when decisions for the person's health care had to be decided, the person was left alone instead of having children and brothers and sisters around them to make decisions as a family. There were also untold hundreds of thousands of people who refused to go to the doctor for regular checkups on other potential health problems like cancer. You know, I've got a lump, but I don't want to go to the doctors because of the pandemic. And they ended up with cancer and dying as well. And not to mention the fact that none of us were able to stay fit or many of us were not able to stay fit during the pandemic, which also increased health problems. But what about the psychological problems that so many people felt because of isolation 
and removal from society with a lack of interaction with people, especially children who have been isolated. It's going to be decades until we know exactly how extensive those repercussions are. And also, let's not forget the election. You know, I talk about this a lot, but I can't emphasize it enough. Every single bad decision that was made in the 2020 presidential election, which forced us all into mail-in or drop-off ballots in those drop boxes that were easily infiltrated, all of those decisions were made under the guise of, well, we've got a pandemic and it's dangerous to allow people to stand in line at their regular voting place. So we got to give them an alternative. We can't have them risk their health to go and vote. And we know we can't have them standing in line and waiting to vote because we have to stay six feet apart. So we'll do this whole mail-in ballot thing and we'll count ballots that don't have a date on it. And we'll count ballots that don't have a signature. We'll count ballots even though we don't know if it came in after the election or before the election. These were all decisions made because of the social distancing requirements under the pandemic. And oh, guess what? Three years later, Anthony Fauci says, you know, that whole social distancing thing where everyone had to stand six feet apart. I don't know where that came from. That just showed up one day, but there was no science behind it. There was no reason why we had to socially distance. The entire reason why we upended our regular voting process in 2020 that shockingly, thanks to a couple of thousand votes in strategic states like Georgia, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, handed the presidency to Joe Biden, the entire impetus for that, social distancing, was just sort of made up and showed up without Anthony Fauci even knowing where it came from. So I'll add to your list, Bill Maher, before we let you continue dissenting opinions that were suppressed and ridiculed at the time have proven to be correct. Maybe that's why the powers that be never wanted a COVID commission. Why not? We love commissions. The Warren Commission, the AIDS Commission, the 9-11 Commission. So where's the COVID commission? Because it seems to me we haven't learned a thing. Maybe the number one lesson from the pandemic was the need for proper air ventilation. Second was never go on a Zoom with Jeffrey Tubin. If there's been a ba big national movement to retrofit buildings, I missed it. Gain of function research is still going on in labs. We're still torturing animals by raising our food in conditions ideal for viruses to make the leap to humans. Bird flu was just found in a goat, which means we're just one lonely farmer from the next pandemic. We handed out $4 trillion of free money, 280 billion of which was just flat out stolen in what the AP called the greatest grift in US history and which started an inflationary spiral that we now blame on Biden. So we're gonna bring back Trump, the guy who ignored COVID COVID like it was the dinner check? Yeah, he had to throw that last one in there because of his audience and because of the Lords and Masters at HBO. Trust me, I'm no great fan and pal of Bill Maher, but he's saying things that he wasn't saying several years ago, and it's because he's starting to take the turn. And you bet your ass we blame Biden for inflation because when he took office, he decided to print more money in his big stimulus package and then his big infrastructure package that he ended up calling a climate change package. And none of those things were necessary. And he ruined the economy that was finally starting to get back on its feet. But the important thing is that Bill Maher is actually addressing these things, which is more than I can say for an actual news program on CNN or MSNBC. And one other part of his show this weekend that uh, bears watching, uh, the gentleman there who was laughing during, they kept cutting to him with the blue tie. Did he look familiar? That was Mark Esper. He was the Secretary of Defense under President Trump in the final year of the Trump administration. And the subject of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and CRT and transgender policies in our military came up. You know, there's only one branch of our military that has met its recruitment goals this last year. It's the Marine Corps. And I happen to know that of all the branches, the Marine Corps has really shied away from the whole DEI thing. Their main focus when they talk to recruits and when they talk to people who are in the Marine Corps, and I know people in the Marine Corps, the main communication that they get from their superior officers is, you're a Marine, that's your identity, that's what you identify as, and your job is to kill the enemy. Now let's get training. And shockingly, the people who want to join the military and do just that, they're going to the Marines. So is the woke military really ruining 
our fighting ability. A woke military is threatening our readiness. What are they talking about specifically? What kind of things? And is there any credibility to that? It's not as bad as the right would say. It's worse than what the left will acknowledge. That's uh, everything in America. You're right. <laughs> this administration set up a DEI office that would, would, would dictate DOD policies for education. There are classes on what to say and what not, what not to say. For example, you shouldn't say, hey, guys. You should say, hey, everyone. In the military? In the military. You shouldn't say, uh, mom and dad. You should say, parents and guardians. The colorblind argument. There's the issue issue of, you know, drag queen story hours on post. Now, look, I don't think this is driven from the, the leadership at the Pentagon. I think it's coming from the White House and from people within the administration who come in and believe that they're pushing their agenda forward. It takes time and resources away from the troops that they should otherwise be training and preparing for war. And it further divides us, putting people into buckets, whether you're based on your ethnicity, your gender, your sex, the color of your skin. I'm sorry, you're in the military. If you're in the army, you're all green. If you're in the Air Force, you're all blue. We have a common mission, a common purpose. Let's stop subdividing and identifying people because it creates friction that undermines morale and readiness. A great answer, by the way, from Mark Esper, who is, you know, uh, touch and go on certain issues. But the most important takeaway from that, and again, I listen, I'll take the crumbs right now from people like Bill Maher. I'm glad he's actually having guests on that are answering those questions that he's asking. And he's been doing more and more of this over the last couple of years. I think something did switch with him in the pandemic. But the most important takeaway from Mark Esper's answer there about you know legitimizing and confirming that we do have a problem with the woke military and it's just going to get worse before it gets better is that this is coming from the White House and it's coming from the political appointees at the Pentagon. In other words, the political appointees at the Pentagon, they leave when a new administration comes in. So all it takes is a new commander in chief in the White House and all new political appointees from that commander in chief and the direction can turn quickly, quicker than you think.